come to the penultimate section in Revelation. Next week, we're going to be looking at chapters 21 and 22, looking at that glorious picture of the wedding supper of the Lamb, with God dwelling with his people, wiping away tears. But before we get to that glorious picture, we see the end of evil. What we see in these chapters will help us to really appreciate what we see in the the last two chapters. So it's a big section we're looking at, four chapters, and I encourage you to take some time to read through that whole big section. So pause this video, that'll take you a while, but it's important to get your head into the passage before we look at it together. As always, I'm going to highlight a few things that have stood out for me to give you some tools to help you to dig in further. But before we dig in together, also take some time to pray and ask God to open your eyes to see wonderful truths in his word. And as we see in the letters to the churches in chapters 2 and 3, pray that the Spirit would give you ears to hear what he has to say to his church today. Well, I'm going to separate out some of the characters that we see in this big section. Um, It starts in chapters 17 and 18 with a picture of this great prostitute. So, uh, the first two and a little bit of chapters are focusing in. The main character there is um, this prostitute. We are told up front here um, who the prostitute is, who she represents. So, she represents Babylon the Great. Now, it's very, very important. We aren't thinking specifically of Babylon as just the city of Babylon. Babylon is um, used throughout Scripture to symbolize rebellion against God. So Babylon is a picture of people who set themselves up together against God. And this starts all the way back in Genesis 11 at the Tower of Babel. Um, Babel is later called Babylon. And if you think about the book of Daniel, where we see Nebuchadnezzar setting himself up against God, setting up his big golden statue. And um, throughout the scriptures in the prophets, we see Babylon being pictured as um, symbolizing society, people who are standing in rebellion against God, setting themselves up together against God. And what we see in these early chapters is that Babylon is going to fall. One very key thing worth uh, picking out in this whole big section is that although the scene sets up for a battle over and over again, we see that the battle is easily won. Um, For example, here in verse 14, see, they will wage war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will triumph over them because he is the Lord of Lords and King of Kings and with him will be his called chosen and faithful followers. So the Lamb will triumph. That's one of the key things that we need to hold on to in this whole big picture. Don't get lost in all of the details. Um, Don't get lost in how splendid Babylon might look. And you see the rich people, the merchants of the earth are, are weeping because they have grown rich from her excesses. But what this whole big picture is showing us is that Babylon, even though she will wage war against the Lamb, the Lamb will triumph. And just quickly to trace that idea through the chapters, um, how we see the, the Lamb triumphing with ease. Later on in chapter 19, we'll see the beast and I'll show you Uh, how the beast is another character in this section. But we see here that the beast also sets up to wage war against the rider on the horse and his army. We'll look at that in a moment. But again, verse 20. So if you read these together, then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their enemies gathered together to wage war against the rider on the horse 
and his army, but the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet who had performed the signs on its behalf. With these signs he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulphur. The rest were killed with the sword coming out of the mouth of the rider on the horse, and all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. So again, chapter 19, verse 19 to 21, we see a battle scene is set, but Jesus wins with ease. Evil is dealt with. And then ultimately, in chapter 20, verse 10, We see the devil who had deceived them. So again, there's this battle scene, um, Satan being released and gathering all the nations for a battle. But then it says, and the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur. Also here, fire came down from heaven and devoured them. The battle is won with ease. That is the big thing to hold on to in this, this whole big section, is that evil is dealt with with ease. So in the first part of this big section, the focus is on um, Jesus destroying, winning the battle over evil. And in this case, um, Babylon, those who set themselves up in rebellion against God, Let's quickly just trace through this section what we are told about Jesus. So we see that this woman was drunk with the blood of God's holy people, the blood of those who bore, the test, bore testimony to Jesus. So they are a society who is setting themselves up against God, and that often means they are setting themselves up against God's people. But here, as we've already seen, they will wage war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will triumph because He is the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Jumping ahead to chapter 19, in verse 11, again we see um, this picture of the wedding supper of the Lamb. Uh, that is just a foretaste of the picture that we're going to see of that supper in Technicolor Brilliance in chapters 21 and 22. Um, but what we also see here in 19 verse 11 is a picture of Jesus, the Lamb. But unlike we've seen him in Revelation so far, now he's pictured as a rider on a white horse and he's called Faithful and True. And this links us back with earlier descriptions. Although he's this rider on uh, the horse, he is this one with blazing fire, eyes like blazing fire and many crowns. So we've seen similar descriptions of him. Here he's called the Word of God. Um, remember John who's writing this also wrote the Gospel of John. And in the Gospel of John we hear him say in chapter 1 verse 14 and the Word became flesh and tabernacled with us, made his dwelling with us. Jesus is the word of God. So that's who this rider on the horse is. Um, we see a bunch of frightening pictures of him, um, a sword coming out of his mouth, and he's trampling them in the wine press of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. But here we see again, he is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, which we saw earlier in the the section. Okay, so two key char characters so far: Babylon the Great setting herself up against uh, the the Lamb, who is the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. In the section, we also uh, see the Beast again. Um, this woman is riding the Beast. We've met the Beast earlier on. But the beast really comes into focus only in chapter 19, verse 
uh, 19 we see here, we've seen it already, that the beast and the kings of the earth gather to wage war. But we see the beast was captured and with it the false prophet. So these are the two beasts that we saw earlier in Revelation. Um, they are easily captured. They are the ones who had deluded people, those who had received the mark of the beast, which we also saw, that 666, that invisible mark of ownership of all those who set themselves up against God. But we see that these two beasts are thrown into the fiery lake of burning sulfur, and those who had followed them are killed. And then one more key character in this section, um, we see the dragon. That great red dragon that we met in chapter 12, who is that ancient serpent, who is the devil or Satan. So the father of lies, the source of all evil. And again, the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur. There is no battle in these chapters in Revelation and it's important to remember why we don't see a battle here. It's because if you want to see the battle scene, you have to go and read the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The war was won on the cross. As Jesus died, the death blow was dealt on the devil. And so in these chapters, we are just seeing um, Jesus finishing what he began on the cross. Um, as he, he dealt with the devil, now we're seeing evil come to an end completely and, and easily. It's as easy as Jesus breathing, which is something we see throughout the Bible. Um, God is spoken of as from the breath of his lips, he's dealing with evil. And that's just a picture. If God is powerful enough to deal with evil just with the breath of his mouth, it just shows how powerful he is and how much inferior evil is. The power of evil is compared with his power. Just as this big section starts, we read, One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls, which we saw last time, came and said, I will show you the punishment. So punishment is the theme in this whole big section um, we see here the punishment fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great and the response of those who loved Babylon to that very hard fall. We see here that it is the Lord God who judges. That's what's happening here. And that judgment causes people to cry out, Woe! Woe! Woe just means, Oh, how terrible! Oh, how terrible! Great city of Babylon, we thought that you would protect us and make us rich and cause us to prosper. But actually now we realize that all you have offered comes to nothing. Oh, how terrible. For God has judged. And with the judgment she imposed on you. So just as people had faced, Christians had faced suffering at the hands of those who had set themselves up against God, so God will judge them. The punishment fits the crime. And here again we see, for true and just are his judgments, for he has condemned the great prostitute. Again, we see this rider riding out with justice to judge and to wage war. At the beginning of chapter 20, we see that he is coming to judge. And then right at the end, we see the dead were judged. Every person was judged according to what he had done. So it's very clear beginning and end, the overarching theme of this whole big section is judgment. But it is judgment showing that evil is going to come to an end. So actually, this whole section is really good news. And that is why we see a number of times in this section a response, a happy response 
to this. So we see here heaven rejoicing. The people of God rejoicing. The apostles and prophets rejoicing because those who set themselves up against God are being judged. Evil is coming to an end. In chapter 19, it starts with um, another picture of heaven rejoicing. And we see this word, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, why? For our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice. So this picture of evil coming to an end, so the great city of Babylon being thrown down, causes heaven to rejoice. It is a good thing to see the end of evil. And the chapters continue by showing even more reason. Although they were rejoicing at the fall of Babylon, there's more reason to rejoice because the beast is going to go down and ultimately Satan himself is going to be thrown into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. I need to make key mention to this um, thousand years. It's mentioned in these few verses at the beginning of chapter 20. Now, this thousand years, often called the millennium, has sadly divided Christians. It's a great pity that such great division has come from something that's only mentioned in these six verses and only in this chapter in the whole Bible. But these verses have divided many Christians. Um, people take a strong stand on how you understand a thousand years. And sadly, some people will say your understanding of this thousand years actually determines whether you're a Christian or not. And it's a real pity that something with so little prominence in the Bible has caused such division. Um, I, contend, I want to contend here that this is a secondary thing. It's a secondary issue. It's not one of the primary gospel issues that we need to um, kind of put our flag in the ground on. I am going to put a flag in the ground um, at this point, but I'm happy for others to, to take a different stand. I, as I've worked my way through Revelation, and we've seen numbers throughout Revelation being symbolic, I don't take this thousand years as a literal thousand years. Um, sometime in the future where Satan is going to be bound and there's going to be a time of peace on earth, I don't understand it like that. I understand this thousand years as speaking about the days we're living in right now, the church age, the days between Jesus' first and second coming. So I take it that we're living in these days right now. And so understanding this in that framework, during these days, Satan is bound. He's been thrown into the abyss, uh, locked and sealed over him to keep him from deceiving the nations until the thousand years are ended. Now, how I understand that in the context of the whole of Revelation is that Satan's power is limited in these days because of what happened on the cross. The war was won on the cross. Now, that doesn't mean that Satan has no power. He's not yet destroyed and he still will deceive some, but he can't deceive everyone because the gospel is more powerful. So during these, these days, this church age between Jesus' first and second coming, people will turn to Jesus. Many will, and we rejoice in that. And there will come a day where Satan will be released and he will go out to deceive the nations more. But that will be an absolute limited time. As Christians, we don't need to fear that final day because we are secure because of Jesus. And ultimately, we can rest because the devil who deceived them is thrown into the lake of burning sulfur. We do not need to fear this final night. But as we get to the end... We need to take very seriously what, how John ends this section. Because after all these pictures of battles that Jesus easily wins, we get the scene that is a courtroom scene. The final verses, 20 verse 11 to 15. 
And in this scene, we see books being opened. Books are opened. There is a book for every person. Both great and small, they're all standing before the throne. And as these books are opened, uh, these are an account of what every person throughout history has done. And then another book is opened. This is the Lamb's Book of Life. If your name is not in that book, then you will be judged according to what you've done. Only those whose names are in the book of life will be left standing on this great day of judgment. Because each person is going to be judged according to what they've done. And if I am judged according to what I've done, I stand no chance. So I need to make sure that my name is in the Lamb's book of life so that I am judged according to what the Lamb has done. His blood was shed to win people for God. So that on this final day, when evil comes to an end, the only way I can stand is if my name is in this book. And so at the end of this big picture of evil coming to an end, as those whose names are in the Lamb's Book of Life, we should rejoice. The end of evil causes us to stand amazed at what Jesus has achieved for us. And we are going to look ahead next week into this picture. Those whose names are in the Lamb's Book of Life will be with Jesus forever in a place where there's no more crying and no more dying and no more sickness and no more pain. It is a glorious thing to look forward to. And we can look forward to it with great hope and with great assurance because as we look at that picture, we can know that evil has come to an end. And so the picture that is our eternity is an eternity with absolutely no evil. Hallelujah, for the Lord God Almighty reigns.